Come on, people. It's time to live it up. This is Tanya McKiernan um, on the director's cut. Uh, Rosemary Rodriguez is still in New York doing The Good Wife, but she will be back next week. So uh, I'm here again to uh, bring another guest to you. And I'm so excited to bring this guest. I've known this man since I was born. <laughs> um, Mike Post, the amazing composer, who was a friend of my father, Stephen J. Cannell. Um, who wait, wait, wait. I was his best friend. His best friend. I was going to say that too, and I didn't say it. Okay. Um, uh, but you had a career before my dad, right? Absolutely. When I met him, he had never sold a script, and I was a made guy. So let's make sure that that's... You had already won a Grammy. I had already won a Grammy. I had already been... You know, I'd already played on hit records. I'd already produced hit records. I'd already arranged hit records, and I was already the music director of the Andy Williams show. Wow, do I sound sibilant in this? Wow, it's in this fun, mic. It's fun, huh? Yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's good. So, but from and it's fun and it's and it's interesting to me because I was thinking about doing this, and I've known you my whole life, so yep. it's like we don't ever really talk about what you do. You know, it's like we're just family, right? Right. So I was I was doing research on you today, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, I didn't know that. You know, and, and I knew that you had had a Grammy before you and my father worked together. Right. But your second Grammy was for Rockford Files. Correct. Which I didn't know. And I was like, that's that's really amazing. And and before I get into playing some of your music, um, you have to tell the story of how you and my father met. It's my okay. favorite. This is the second time today I've told this story. <laughs> no, no, no kidding. I had, I had breakfast this morning with a... Buddy of mine, Herb Peterson, and a, a young uh, guy that wants to be a composer, great bluegrass fiddle player named Gabe Witcher. And uh, so he was, I was giving, I actually was complimenting your father by saying, you know, here's the best note I ever got from a producer on, you know, what kind of music he wanted me to write for a particular thing, which odd story I'll tell later. But so... Uh, Herb said, tell Gabe how you met Camel. I said, well, back before I owned a place in Hawaii or I could afford to really go to Hawaii much, <laughs> um, we, uh, we took our family summer vacations uh, at Balboa Island. So my brother and I shared a house uh, about a block from the ocean. Saturday morning comes, and my brother, who's five and a half years older than I am and bigger and a lot tougher, uh, we both wake up. You know, we don't talk a lot. We just, seven o'clock in the morning, we got to go stake out some territory on the beach uh, before our parents are coming down and the kids are waking up and the thing's happening and all. So we walk the block from the house we're renting down to the beach and it's, you know, I mean, it's overcast. It's a marine layer. And I jump over the seawall, and he jumps over. And right where we tell our parents we're going to meet him, there's all these towels out there. And I go, what the hell? It's 7 in the morning. Who sticks their towels out here at 7 in the goddamn morning? So Bud goes, well, I'll go around this little uh, pier here, and I'll, I'll see. Maybe there's some room on the other side. And I go, okay. So he goes around there, and I just look at these towels. And I go, this is bullshit. I'm going to move these towels. So I start moving these towels, and all of a sudden I hear, hey, hey, quit moving my towels. And I go, what the? I turn around, and I look back, and there's this great big beachfront house, and there's this complete jerk-off standing in a doorway with a iron jaw beard, so stupid, and he's smoking a little thin cheroot. I, I immediately do not like this guy. I'm going, oh, who is this guy? What? And he's screaming at me. 
No, oh, people- by the way, I heard that the towels were shoved under the pier. Okay, that was his version of it, you know. <laughs> Both of us only wish he was here because we, he and I'd be laughing so hard we'd be peeing our pants. But, but the truth is, I just moved him a little bit. I didn't shove him under the pier. Right. I moved him a little bit. So, I, and he's quacking away. And I go, okay, I quit moving my. He's whining like a little girl, you know. And I, so I looked over. I said, hey, I didn't move any towels. Shut up. He goes, no, you should. So I go, this is it. So I start walking back, and I jump over the seawall, and I now I cross the little sidewalk, and I'm on uh, your grandparents' little walkway, and the closer I get, the bigger this guy gets. Now I'm looking at this guy. Jesus, this guy's actually pretty big. This is gonna. I'm gonna. I got my hands full here. And he was like, I can probably take him. That's well, what he was saying. Well, he he might have been saying that. But but I'm looking at him going, you know, this is I'm going to have my hands full. This is going to be a real deal, you know. And then I hear my brother's whistle and stop me cold. And he screams at me, champ, 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 don't do it, don't do it. So I go, uh, I kind of stop. And now my brother comes up. My brother at the time is 5 foot 11, about 230. And 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 he actually liked to fight. I was a phony. I, I like to pretend to fight, but... My brother actually liked it and and really good at it, you know, really good at it. And he goes up and he goes and he looks at Steve and he goes, how big are you? Oh, I'm 6'1", 6'2", 6 6'1". What do you weigh? He says, uh, 195. He goes, well, look, he's 5'8", and he weighs about 165 pounds, but he's real tenacious. He, he'll probably get you. He's he determined. But if he doesn't, you're going to be in an ambulance. I'm going to send you to the hospital. I'm going to really do it to you. Go ahead. You can try. You know, maybe you'll get lucky. Maybe maybe you're tougher than he is. But if you hurt him, my little brother, I'm going to, I'm going to hurt you bad. So your father looks at him, looks at me, and I'm all puffed up. And he goes, right. He walks back in the house. He, you know, figures both of us are going to jump him and kill him, you know. Literally, we got back to the sidewalk, and I'm feeling so guilty. I'm going, God, what's wrong with me? I'm, I'm a grown-up. What am I doing? I'm, I'm a legitimate guy. I'm a conductor of the Andy Williams show. I'm a, you know, I'm not just a North Hollywood idiot. I've, this is terrible. So we go back. I tell my, my wife at the time, Darla, I said, God, I just was such an asshole. I'm, why was I? This guy, this, I moved his towels. I lied like a rug, you know. So we, I'm feeling really bad about it. We go back down there at 11 o'clock. He's out there with your mom and a playpen and your brother and, you know, and there's, and you know, Michael John's in a playpen and I'm there. I think Jennifer had just been born, you know, and you were just born. And no, I was actually you, you in, were, I was. You I were was, in your mommy. Yeah. I was in my mom's yep. stomach. So, I mean, it was like really, I walk right over. I said, okay, no excuses. I'm a jerk. I was wrong. I moved him. I lied. And I wouldn't have been near as brave without my big brother. And he goes, oh, it's okay. There's plenty of room. I was just being real territorial and, you know, pissing on fire hydrants and whatever, you know. And so we laughed. He goes, so we start talking. And he goes, what do you do? I said, well, you know, I'm an arranger, record producer. What have you produced? I said, well record called Classical Gas and, you know, the first edition just dropped in. And he go, oh, my God, I love that stuff. That's fantastic. And I said, well, I'm the music director of the Andy Williams Oh, I love the Andy Williams show. You know, he's like, I said, well, what do you do? And he goes, oh, geez. He goes, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be a writer, but I've never sold a script. And I look back at this house. I go, it's a pretty nice house. He goes, oh, no, my parents are really wealthy. They've, they've got some money. I don't have anything. I've never done anything. He said, I'm really struggling. And I said, well, I'd like to read what you've written, you know. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to ask Steve twice, you know. It's like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he'll tell you the story. And oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the, well, okay, so it starts out, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, really, really. Exactly. Yeah, what if, you know. So he runs back with, a, you know, some, some script. And I started reading it. It's really funny. I mean, it was funny right from the jump. It was just funny. And. 
So then the whole rest of the week, we're playing sports together. We're throwing a football. Now, the guy's an ash. He's a really an athlete, you right. know. And both my brother and I were kind of athletes. And so, you know, now we're going water skiing together. And we're doing all this other stuff. And I'm going, God, this guy's really great. And he probably would have kicked the hell out of me, you know. So that's how we met. And that's how the friendship started, 1968. And how, and how long before, after you met him, did he actually sell his first script about six months maybe six maybe, months yeah maybe six or eight months he sold that first script uh to you know to uh, uh to uh, either to dragnet or to something you know i think it was dragnet or yeah. it wasn't adam 12 was no it? no not yet no not yet that was about another six months you know yeah and then uh and but he jack webb noticed him and you know took him you know made a you know made a move on him and then within a year he was working on uh on, on adam 12 on adam 12 and then about a year later he was doing rougher files correct no 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 no, no. was that toma. longer toma yeah, right right and did you did you write the the music well here's what happened so he he's working with roy huggins right. and, and you know and and i you know i there's nothing i'm doing in tv i'm a rock and roll record producer and i'm you know i don't know so he calls me up. He goes, hey, maybe you can help me with something. I said, what? He goes, well, I'm doing this show with Roy Huggins called Toma. And we, uh, Huggins' com composer is a really good guy, a really good guy, but a jazz guy. And he said, he's written a theme and a the score, and it's just awful. It's just not what I want. It's, it's just, you know, it's old, and it's not, you know, it's, I said, yeah. He goes, would you consider doing this? I go, no, nah, I'm not bullshit. I don't want to be messing around with film, television. You know, it comes through a little speaker. I had enough with the Andy Williams show for two years. I'm, I'm in a rock and roll business. I'm too hip for this room, you know, I'm really too hip. He goes, please, no, I really would appreciate it. And I said, well, I got this buddy of mine, Pete Carpenter, who's an older guy, had done some film television with Earl, Earl Hagen and did some I Spy and did some sitcoms and stuff. And I said... All right, let me let me talk to him, and you know, I mean, I I love you, so I'll do whatever. You know, I don't give it, I don't care, but I'll I'll try it. So he goes, okay, great. So we redid the score for the pilot to Toma, and the minute I looked at film without music, I went, oh, I know what that could be, you know. Oh, well, why don't we do this? You know, and then we we did it real. I tried to make little hit records out of it, this stuff, you know, and, and Cannell went, oh, man, this is great. That's exactly what I'm looking for. That's perfect, you know, and, you know, forget the record. There is no record business anymore, and there's still television, so who knows? You know? Well, and, and, and it's, it's I, I am going to do my low-budget thing, which I told you I was going to do. But um, one of the things I want to ask you while I'm getting this is your process like you don't ever do you read the scripts of the shows that you're that you're going to compose or do you wait until you see the pilot or how like how do you what's your what's your starting point either or uh, sometimes in the old days Stephen would go uh, uh can you uh, 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 uh can you go to lunch with me yeah what's up uh, 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 I want to tell you a story Remember your dad stuttering? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever he was excited or whenever he was like a little bit uncomfortable, like he's pitching something, you know, and he's like, God, God I don't want my best friend to just dump on me, you know. So I go, yeah, what do you got? So a lot of times he would tell me a story. And and that was great. That was so much fun. He was such a good storyteller. I mean, really. Oh, would, God. Yeah, yes. he was the best. Yeah. I mean, no wonder they bought all those shows because he was pitching this stuff by telling stories. So, I mean, he was, you know, he's Burl Lives or whatever you want to call it. You know, he was great at telling stories. But, you know, sometimes I, I, I read a script. Sometimes I waited until and saw, a, you know, Hill Street. I, I, you know, Bochco never sent me a script or anything. He just said, I want you to see a picture. And I went over there and saw that picture and went, wow, that's I'd never seen t TV like that. You know, uh, I think on Rockford, Cannell called me and said, uh, I want you to read something. 
oh, no, don't do that. I just want to tell you this story. And so he told me the story, you know. So that's my perfect segue and hopefully my low-budget way of playing the Rockford File theme song will work. Okay. Well, you had a, you had a glass of wine at dinner, didn't you? Oh, shut up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and you had two what? Oh, uh, yeah. Two martinis, but Tim... Did you screw up dinner tonight, Tim? <laughs> totally. Tim's my husband. Yeah, yeah. Wait. Wait for it. Was this was this the uh, was this the first version of the song? Did you did you play this song for him after he told the story, or did he woof all over you? No, 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 no. He, uh, you know, whenever it really got down to music, you know, we put away all the bullshit, you know, and it was like, okay, now we're talking about the real deal. We're not just posturing or replaying who took whose towels and moved them or whose yeah. big brother. You know, now, now we're talking about the real deal. And um, I played it for him on piano and sang him the synth part. I went... And I sang it to him. And he went, whoa, 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 whoa. That's really hooky. I said, yeah, this is going to be good. Dude, you don't need to know anymore. It's going to be good. You know, a weird thing happened. Uh, somebody sent me a clip from Fallon a week ago or two weeks ago. And Fallon's talking to Higgins. That's his guy, right? Yeah. And he said, uh, TV theme songs. What's your favorite TV theme song? And Higgins did it. And he did the... The mini mo, but like dramatically, and it's way overboard. And it was funny as hell, and it was good. And somebody sent it to me. The guy did the whole thing, the guitar solo, everything. It was. I should have. I should reach out to the guy and send him a autograph thing that he won't give a shit about. But that must you know. no. But that must be awesome. Like it must be awesome to to have all those sounds that you've created. You know, like I hear Greatest American Hero theme song all the time. You know, it's on different shows and, and all this stuff. It must, it must, I mean, how is that for you having created that? Does it? My gig, you know, there's the difference between your old man and me. <laughs> you know, your old man would get in that red Thunderbird with his, you know, with his, with that, with the hair thing he had going on, his hair if anybody's listening that knew him knew that he was the only white guy in the world with that haircut. You know, he looked like little Richard or something, you know, but he, his hair was so perfect and puffed up and everything. And he'd get in that, this red Thunderbird 56, right? Yeah. Yeah. 56. And he'd drive down the freeway and just dying for everybody to recognize him from the living logo. And well, yeah, I mean, I remember picking out, helping pick out that logo. The the if if people don't know who my dad is, just by the name Stephen J. Cannell, he created so many shows in the '80s and '90s, and he was the guy who typed on the typewriter and pulled out the piece of paper and it made a C. And I remember picking out out of like two hundred different. I, he probably showed them to you too. <laughs> you know, which one do you think is going to be the best one? Yeah. Well, because I had to write the music, bam, bam, bitter down. You yeah. Know? I mean, I had to write this little five second deal. Um, but he and I are 100% different. Uh, he was dying to go to the 7 Eleven and have people go, wow, you're that producer with this picture on the end of the logo, or you're the guy that's in, you know, Renegade or whatever, you know. Uh, and I'm going, Cannell, what is wrong with you? Why do you want it? I don't know. I just dig it. I think it's really cool. You know, and it, the truth is he was never in a band like I was in the band at 16. And, you know, so it I, he had this itch that he needed to scratch, you know. And with me, it was just, 
I, you know, I had the best gig in the world. So what does it feel like? The truth is, even when you just stuck that, your, your phone up there and, and played it, it's, I could remember writing it. I can remember playing it. I could remember doing it. I could remember having a hit record, but there's a, a weird disconnect. There's a weird thing of, and, and the best that's ever been articulated was uh, James Taylor wrote a song once called, Hey, Mister, That's Me Up on the Jukebox. And he's sitting in a bar and all of a sudden he comes on radio, I mean on the jukebox, and, and it's like the bartender doesn't know it's him and he wants to say, God, that's me. And it actually has happened to me many times, not many times, but a number of times. And the, the best it ever happened was in the summer of 75, I was on the Hollywood Freeway going from the Valley, where I still live, down to MGM Records, which had released the theme from the Rockford Files. And it was a big hit. It was on KHJ at the time. And I was at just at the Barham overpass. And we are, I'm in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. And I'm headed down to the record company to help promote the record, blah, blah, blah. My windows are down. There's a guy parked next to me, or stopped next to me in a car. And he's got the same radio station I have. And all of a sudden, -da 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 -da, and he reaches down and grabs it and turns it up, cranks it. And then he realizes that it's coming in stereo from somewhere. And, oh, the guy next to me is listening to the same thing. And he looks over and he gives me a thumbs up like, isn't that fucking cool? And I look and I almost said, I was, that's me. That's mine. Yeah, I, it's, and I just went, yeah. And I gave him a thumbs up and I went like, Wow, what a weird out of body experience this is. This is a, this is the weirdest thing to ever happen. And you know, it's happened in various different ways over the years. It's it's I know it's me. I remember doing it. But almost it's almost not me alone. It's me and Pete and your old man. Yeah. You know, it's it's like god, that was us. That was us then. You know, I can still do it. I still do it every week. But, God, it's, it's like, I don't know. It's it, it, There's a little bit of a of an amazement that I actually make a living doing this shit. Yeah. 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 But I, it's it's amazing because you've, you've composed two things for me um, separately. I did two different PSAs, and you did one for me last year. And... It's just, it's amazing to watch you work. It's amazing for you, because with me, you just watched the film that I had shot. And, um, and to watch you layer all the different sounds on top of each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there, is there something you like to start with first? Like a set, like, is it piano or is it, I mean, what, what is, or, or can it, or is it just the visual that makes you think of, yeah, it's more basic than that. It's it's even more down to the bare metal. First of all, everything you shoot, everything that your old man ever wrote is in a tempo. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. You guys don't even know it, but but he 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 wrote in a tempo. Right. The the words tumble out in a tempo. And then a really good director comes in there and shoots it in a tempo. Right. Okay. And then, and then the really, the where the tempo really comes, up, becomes apparent to everyone is when they edit it. Right. They cut it in a tempo. Right. And then I sit, you know, I'm completely Rain Man. You know, you know, you, know, you Rain more, Man. Yeah, really? yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. I got no brains. So there's no, <laughs> there's no. It's not like I'm smart. You, you know, know, I'm gonna remember that when you say I have no brains, I'll bring that up later. You know, but the truth. The truth is, you know, I, I look at the picture and I, and I go, well, what were you thinking when you wrote that wonderful piece of thinking? Are you shitting me? Thinking? I'm not thinking anything. You know, I'm just doing. I'm just, you know, it's music. So there's no thinking involved. There's just, there's, well, this thing happens, you know, and it's like your old man and I would get together and he'd go, I go, uh, 
what are you doing? He goes, I'm just listening to the voices in my head and, and typing it as fast as I can in that hieroglyphics that he called English, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, Steve Cannell was extremely dyslexic, so he, he spelled... The only guy I've ever met spelled worse than me. So, you know, I mean, he was like... Well, you know, it's funny. He wrote something out for me once. He typed it out. And he came... He, he And I was supposed to read it or I was supposed to do something. I can't remember what it was. But he came in and he was like, okay, well, let me explain it to you. And because I'm dyslexic too, I'm like, you don't even bother. I can I can read it. Yeah. It, 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 it. You don't need to worry about it. Takes one to know one, you know. I mean, yeah, exactly, exactly. And neither... Both of you would be lost without Grace Gershia, So Oh, I know. And Grace... What was Grace saying? It was a damn third finger that fucked everything up. That's exactly... Exactly right. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> because my father used to type with two fingers on both sides and the middle finger would always get in the way and it would push an extra key that wasn't supposed to be there. And so she'd ha she was the only one who could decipher it. The only one. That was such muddled bullshit until she got a hold of it. And right. then it was brilliant. You know, it's right. like, okay, all right, well, that's what he meant to say. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, it's like, what, wait, what? What What was he writing? Is he really a writer? No, you know what? It was Grace was the writer. He wasn't the writer. <laughs> he was some, he was a Martian, you know, but that's okay. That's, which is why he and I were friends. But um, the, the truth is that once you, a, once a composer figures out the tempo, once you feel the tempo of any scene or any piece, that's the key that un, unlocks the magic door. You know, now, now the music's easy. Well, it was always easy, but I mean, it's really easy now once you got what the tempo is. Right. So the process isn't a thinking thing. It's a feeling thing. Mm -hmm. And, and the other part of the process is the big secret that, that you guys don't know that all of us know is, and you, you come and you come to my studio and you go, man, this guy really good at his job. He's really talented. Ah, there's 10 good ways to do every picture that you're going to bring to me. There's, right. It's hard to screw it up. I mean, if you bring me a good picture, it's hard to screw up. Yep. It's a hanging curveball. It's like, there's 10 good ways to do this. Now, what's the hard part? The hard part is code breaking. Because you guys, you don't speak music. You speak English. And you speak film. And you speak, you know from a two shot to a one shot to a you know, pen thing and a back and around and you're and you're think you're storytellers you know right i'm just a dirtbag musician we come in through the kitchen we play for the rich people and leave through the kitchen you know i mean it's like what what did she say oh well you know i gotta break the code what does she a what does she need to make this picture more dramatic b what does she want? Now, how do I meld what she wants with what she really needs to make the picture better? And I got to write something that doesn't make me, you know, puke. So, you know, I mean, because it's hard to be. Yeah, but see, I don't, I don't think you give yourself enough credit because just like in directing, there's 150 different ways to shoot something, yep. you know, and it's subjective. It's it, what we do is subjective. You, you, you have a talent, you have a, a point of view and either people like it or they don't like it, right? Right. So for me as a director, you know, you could have a scene where you're like, eh, not so great. And then you as a composer get a hold of it and make it so much better, you know, because the music brings out that extra piece that maybe you wasn't in the words or or whatever, and you can, I mean, I'm amazed all the time because when I edit my shows, usually there isn't, there's temp music in it or it's not, you know, and then I see it air and it's amazing, you know? So it's like you sit there and you say, well, I don't, but you do because it's obviously a, a great skill that you have because you you keep working on these amazing shows. You know, I, take the compliment. All right. Complete, <laughs> com com complete honesty. I don't know. I have, I agree. There's magic involved. There is some sort of hoodoo going on that, uh, where, you know, if you take our parts mm -hmm. and you, you separate them and you look at them, you go, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But when somehow when it's right and it all comes together, there is magic to this thing of life, and it is completely collaborative. 
um, as opposed to writing a piece of music for concert or writing a hit record or writing a piece of, you know, a song that, you know, you, you, Jimmy Webb or Bob Dylan or, or Paul Simon or somebody or Springsteen writes a song and it stands by itself. I don't write that. I write, I write collaborative music. My music makes your pictures hopefully better. And there's, there's some sort of synergy magic thing to, you know, to an idiot like me, you know, looking at a picture without music and going, well, it could be this, you know, why don't we do that? You know, Oh God, this would be cool. You know? And that's different than, than Dylan, you know, sitting in there going, if you're ever traveling to the North country far, you know, I'm, I mean, that's, that's a different genius, you know, and that's a real genius. And I'm just part of a team, you know, and that, and I really believe that. I mean, I, can I make your picture better? Yep, I can. Um, if you bring me a really good picture, I can help. If you bring me a really bad picture, it's going to be a really bad picture with some pretty good music. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, I can't, I can't save you. I can just make you maybe a little bit better. You know. But you, but you also have not only did you work with my father and do almost every one of his shows, but you also worked with Stephen Bochco yep. and did did a majority yeah, of his uh, shows, right? Almost, almost everything he did. Yeah. Almost everything he did. And mm-hmm. and did you meet Stephen through my dad? Of course. So, yeah. You know, he, you know, your old man calls me up because, hey, uh, I got this guy, the really nice guy, really, really talented, really smart, and he's sort of on the edge at Universal here. They, they kind of don't know that his deal's almost up and, you know, and we're going to do something together. I go, oh, okay, good. And he said, do you want to have lunch? And I go, sure, of course. You know, so we go to lunch, you know, two Jews and the whitest guy in the world, your old man. And then we go to lunch and immediately we both just start dumping on Stephen. I mean, Bochco, I mean, Bochco and I are dumping on Candle. It's the funniest thing ever. You know, he's going, oh, my God, you people really stick together, don't you? You know. <laughs> By the way, I'm the first Jew your father ever even, like, had a... a he thought we had horns or something, you know. Like, yeah. Oh, God, he's great. He's just the best, you know. Do you, do you know the story about... So I buy, my, I buy my first really exotic car. I buy a Ferrari. And your old man's down at the boat at, in Newport. And you guys are someplace, I don't know, your mom's traveling with you. And it's just, just me and him. I call him, hey, what are you doing? I don't know, man. I'm just down here at the boat. What are you doing? I said, well, I got this new car I want to show you. He goes, well, you want to have dinner? I'll, I'll barbecue. I oh, went, God. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, can we go out? He goes, ah, yeah, we can go out. Jesus, do you have to bust my balls about everything? Yeah. I said, well, I'll come down. He goes, that'd be great. Good. Come down. So I drive all the way down. And... Um, at the time, I owned a little house at La Costa, which was, you know, that's another half an hour from right. from Newport. So we 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 go out to dinner and we have a couple of glasses of wine. I go, hey, why don't you get in a Ferrari? It's you know, it's really cool. I got this little house at La Costa. Forget, we'll we won't stay on the boat. We'll go down to La Costa. We'll go to the spa tomorrow. We'll you know, we'll take a steam. We'll go out for a run together. We'll take a steam. We'll get a massage. And he's looking at me like I'm. Like I'm speaking Swahili or something. I'm going massage. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> he goes. He goes. I'm not into that. I said, into what part of that aren't you into, you idiot? He goes. Wait a second. He goes. Okay. I, I was trying to spare your feelings. He goes. Okay. This is an ethnic thing. This is a. This is. This is a Jew thing. I said. What? He goes, no, it is. He goes, you guys get in a steam bath and you, you know, you swatch yourself with all that stuff and you call each other Solly and you smoke cigars. And I'm, I'm going, well, are you kidding me? He goes, no, no, I know that's what you do. And, and, and then you let other guys like put oil on you and touch you. I go, you are the whitest guy I've ever met. You're the most homophobic person I've ever met. You're ridiculous. We stayed on the boat that night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and he's homophobic and you're staying on the boat. Okay, I won't yeah, ask yeah. any other no, questions. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you know that I never hugged your father? Really? Never. I we can't shook, believe oh, that. Oh, come on. We shook hands. 
we shook hands. And I, I mean, I, I've seen your father in good, bad, ugly. I, you know, I've seen your father under the worst circumstances, the best circumstances. I've seen your father, you know, every kind of which way, including, you know, two days before he died, you know, never hugged. Loved, wow. e loved each other like brothers never. Oh, well, I know you guys, I know you guys did. I mean, it's like, it, 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 you know, he'd always be like Mike this and Mike that. And, you know, and again, it's like, I have saw you my whole life. Yep. You know, the coolest thing I ever, well, not the coolest ever, but one of the coolest things I ever did to him was, and you were there, you were, I came to, to, uh, to St. John's in Santa Monica. You know, you really sick, really sick. Oh. You know, I, you know, just right before he passed away. So I come in and, and everybody was really nice. They let me, they all cleared out and they just, me and your old man. And he's like out of it, you know, and bad, really bad. And he kind of comes out of this fog and he looks up and he goes, Hey, I said, Hey, I said, how you doing? He goes, I'm all right. I said, okay. I, I got some news for you. He said, what? I said, you want the good news or the bad news? He said, well, give me the bad news. I said, look, if you don't get a hold of yourself and, you know, kind of get back in touch with reality and try and find a way to get all this stomach problems that you got going on stopped, uh, this is actually going to kill you. You know, you gotta, you know, you gotta calm down now and stop your imagination and stop with all these hallucinations and all this shit. You're going. He goes, "What's the good news?" I said, "You know what? You look exactly like me now." His head was shaved. <laughs> I've been bald forever. And he went, "Oh God, just shoot me now! Just shoot me now!" One of the funniest stories was when I was an AD and he was he was working on Renegade. He was he played Dutch Dixon. Um, it was his way of trying to be an actor but um you know he was just <laughs> kind of a hack but um but anyway they scripted that he would go in the water and my father loved his hair so much that he would never get it wet and so because it was scripted he did it but I, st I stood there with a Polaroid camera, and as he was coming out of the Bay of San Diego with a wet head, I took Polaroid pictures of him. And he kept pointing at me going, what, don't you, don't, stop that, don't you, you know. And then, and then when he had to shave his head when he was sick, we were all like, and by the way, he had the most perfectly Perfect. round head Perfect. of anybody I've ever seen. He, he looked great because he kept his goatee even right. through chemo. Lost all his hair, but his head was perfect. There was no. Oh, it was it was perfectly wedding. round, and we we're like, just tell people you got cast in some, you know, yeah. some like feature where you're a badass, like killer That's exactly or something. Exactly right. You know, you're 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 in jail, and you're you're part of the Aryan Brotherhood. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, I have a question for you that I usually ask at the beginning, but we started that that I couldn't ask you. So, your very first job that you ever had in as a musician? What was that? And how did it feel on your first day? Night. Night? Not, night. Not first day. night. Yeah, first night. So what was your first job? Uh, it was playing piano for a band called Frankie Knight and the Jesters on Pico and Genesee, which is two blocks east of Fairfax on Pico. It's now, I think, an electronic store or something. Or a washer dryer store or something. It was a nightclub called Mamas or Alvo Turnos, which was a Italian name for somebody's village or something. And I got this gig. I was just sixteen, and I got this gig playing piano for this band. And the band before they added a keyboard player was just piano, drums, bass and this really good singer named Frankie Knight. And I was at a rehearsal t two weeks before, and I was just sitting there with some friends, and they didn't know the chord changes to this one song, and I did. And I said, you guys are playing the wrong chords. I, I don't mean to be pushy, but you want to know the right chords. So there was a piano on stage, and I walked up, played the song. And the singer, Frankie Knight, said, what's your name? And I said, uh, Mike. And he said... Uh, you want a gig? And I said, yep. So I got 15 bucks a night 
five sets, 45 minutes on, 15 minutes off, plus dinner. They fed us. And um, that was my first gig, and it felt like I'm in the band. Are you shitting me? I'm in the band. And it was great. That's amazing. Yeah. So I have another question now. We'll go back to my family stuff. But when you wrote um, the theme to Grace American Hero, mm. which, again, I will use my low-budget <clears throat> way of doing it, which I have to throw a shout-out to my daughter, Gracie, who told me how to do this. <laughs> because I was like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do it. And she's like, mom, this is how you do it. Yeah. So, um, but I heard, and I don't even know if it's true, but my dad said that he helped write the lyrics. lyrics. Yeah. He, he sort of tweaked the lyrics. Um, the, a really talented guy named Stephen Geyer wrote those lyrics. And the, the, basically the, you know, first of all, the whole thing is, completely screwy because you know how it happened the network you know the networks never come up with anything they're idiots they never come up with anything original so superman was a yeah go ahead you are yep he's playing oh good People sing this still. Crazy, it, huh? Isn't it crazy? We're really weird. Really weird. So what happened was, uh, you know, the network said you know, Superman was a hit, so they went to Cannell and said, okay, we want you to do Superman. Well, he's n never going to, you know, he's not going to just rip something off. He's not going to just do it, you know, normal. He's a Martian. So he goes, okay, let's see here. How do I do this? Okay, it's great. The guy's not Superman. It's the suit. Okay, how does he get the suit? Oh, aliens give it to him. Oh, that's smart. Okay, well, it can't be normal, so he has to lose the directions, and he can't figure out how to fly, and he keeps hitting walls, and he's just he's just really screwed up. And then he brings in a you know, former CIA guy to be his handler to, uh, you know, so he just he twists the whole thing. So... You know, he came and he sat down with me and he said, you know, I, I want a song. I said, you want a song? Oh, my God. You know, first of all, you got this completely twisted, crazy idea on how to do Superman. And now you want a song. And I said, well, you know, uh, I've been working with this guy, Steve Geyer, who's, you know, really brilliant guy, really smart. And so Geyer came in and said, hey, let's make the analogy with love. You know, let's make it about being in love rather than, you know, we don't want to talk about flying a suit that can't fly right because you lost the directions. You know, it's a good idea. So he wrote the basic lyric and then, and then Kendall said, you know, tweak this word or that word or everything else. In his mind, he probably wrote it, but it's okay. That's your, that's your old man. <laughs> <laughs> I know. He was like, and I was like, when I was coming here tonight, I was thinking, I'm asking Mike that question yeah. because my dad always used to say, well, yeah, I wrote the li lyrics to that song. And oh. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. You know, I was at camp actually, and they were. It was didn't it go top ten? Oh, or, no, it was number one. It was record. number one. Yeah. yeah number one, so, number one. so I would listen to it, and all my friends would be singing it at camp, and I'd be like, "Yeah, that was my daddy." It wrote was that. Stephen that wrote the lyrics, but not Stephen Cannell. It was Stephen Geyer that wrote the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, Stephen Cannell wrote the script, and Heather, you know, I was by the oh, you know, he, he. Hey, the truth is, you know, not unlike, not unlike almost everybody in Hollywood. That, you know, that wants to be uh, something other than their gig, they all want to be in a band. Everybody wants to be in a band. And and you know what? I don't blame them. No. It's the best gig. It, it, is, it is the coolest. That's why, you know, great big giant actors, you know, that are huge stars, you know, oh, yeah, they also play guitar. Do they really? Uh, really? They really? Uh, show me one of them that's, you know, that really plays plays great. Well, they play okay, yeah, you know. But everybody, I mean, in, you know, in the last hundred years, what do you really, uh, what's the dream job? I want to be a musician. I don't know why it's that way, but it really is. And, 
you know, I just feel, at at my age, I just feel lucky to still kind of be in the band. Well, I think you are not kind of in the band. I think you're still in the band. I hope I You am. still do the music for Hell Street, or for, um, for Law, and Law and Order. Yep. Right? Yep. So it's, it's. And do you ever, like, because you do the music for every episode, right? Yep. So so does it ever feel like a grind to you? No. I'm, I'm so, I'm so stupid. <laughs> you know, I really, I, honest to God, I'm, I'm, tell, you know, I would never lie to you. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, I mean, I'm so limited <laughs> intellectually. I'm so easily satisfied that. I mean, I've been writing the same music for Dick Wolf for 25 years. Yeah. And getting way overpaid. I hope you're listening to this, Dick. But We'll send it to him. It's yes. going to be on iTunes. Oh, it's perfect. But, I, you know, and I'll every once in a while I'll do something different. That's the only time I ever hear from this idiot. He'll call me up and he goes, what are you doing? And I'm not, I wasn't even sure he was even looking at episodes, you know, right. these days, you know. Right. I'm just, he's just counting money up there, you know, but... But no, he's actually looking at it. He goes, you're so stupid. Don't change it. Just keep going. I go, well, why don't you just cut up what I did 17 years ago and put it in? No, keep writing. This is good. He goes, look, we, you and I are in platinum handcuffs. I, yeah, he's kind of right. So, And the truth is, I still like going to work and being in the same kind of mode and writing the same kind of music maybe it's the exact same music i don't know i get new sounds every year and i i tweak stuff and i change a little something basically it's i'm in the band and the audience wants to hear proud mary so i'm gonna fucking play proud mary because i'm just lucky to be in a band yeah but you know what it's funny it's like when i bring my stuff to you or there's no template so it's like you really kind of go crazy yeah, because, you know? because I'm so happy to be writing something different. You know, you bring me something that I hadn't seen before. You know, not that Law & Order is repetitive, but it's, you know, all episodic TV is pretty You don't want to break the formula, right? No, because no, no. it works. Yeah, it's working, so yeah. don't don't change nothing. But at any rate, you know, when somebody brings me something new, it, it is exciting because, you know, it's, it's not blank paper, but it's, it's, it's blank inspiration because they've... You know, that's a kind of a two-bit word and sort of a phony-ass word. But but the truth is, when you bring me a piece of film, I sit there with a clear mind. I'm, I, don't, I have no preconceived notions. I look at the film and actually get inspired. You go, oh, oh, look, oh, it's this, it's that. It makes me feel this way. Now, how can I, what can I bring to the table that heightens those feelings? What can I, how can I make the sadder parts sadder, the happier parts happier, sexier parts sexier, the the scarier parts scarier? That's my job. My job is to take your stuff and inject, you know, the steroid that is music. Right. Well, and it's and it's amazing to me because as, as an episodic director, I never get to that process. Right. You know, I turn my episode in, it's my little baby that I've made, and then I go, go with God. And let's see what happens. And then when it airs on on TV is when I see what the original score is. And, and there's sometimes where they put like temp music in that they can't afford. Right. And you're like, oh, that's perfect for the scene. And then right. you're like. And you get a letdown because well, it ain't yeah. the stones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're like looking at it going, okay, well, what was done was fine, but it's not that song, right. that name song that, you know. Yep. But um, so it's just, it's fascinating to me the whole process because I do know how much sound helps a picture. Well, you know. To be, to tell the truth, you know, that's the great part of epi episodic TV for composers and the horrible part for directors mm -hmm. and the horrible part for composers in films and the great part for directors in films. And the, okay, here's, God, I hope, I hope none of my composer friends are listening because it's, they're not. Oh, good. This is, this is sacrilege what I'm going to say. So you take like the Revenant, right? Right. As a composer, I should hate that score. Two different composers and actually four different sources of music because not only did they have two really, really accomplished composers, but then they took classical music and laid it in there the way it was originally conceived, and they took classical music and they they sweetened it. They, they 
played music along with it. They they actually enhanced it. Well, Hindermith wasn't really thinking of this when he wrote that. He he did. If he'd have been born now, he would have written this. And they put something on top of a legendary piece of classical music. I should hate that. I should, as a composer, I should go bullshit. Don't you do that? You hire John Williams or Tommy Newman or Randy or me or James Newton Howard, and that's the score. And you know what? I go see that movie and I go, this is awesome. This is fucking awesome. This is so good. I can't believe it. I should hate this, but it's wonderful. Now, how did it happen? Really, the director. The director said, I'm going to, I can't actually write the music, but I can, I can conceive it. I can direct it. I can edit it. I can uh, amalgamate it. I can, I can really almost be the composer. And it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Now, if I, the, if I was a composer on that, I would have wanted to slit my wrist or his throat. But what's the real job of the music in a film? To make the film better. The music made the film so much better in that case. And it's happened a lot lately. You know, uh, my wife and I, my wife Patty and I got into the Nick. So we turn on the pilot of the Nick. It's a story about 1900 medicine in 1900. We're sitting in bed. We're watching a thing. It's Soderbergh. It's Cliff Martinez, his his guy, he's a drummer. He's a, you know, he's a sequence guy, you know. He's, okay, he's not a real composer like me or James Newton Howard or Tommy Newman or, you know, not a real composer. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm going, Patty, I, I don't think this shit works. This is, that's all wrong. It's 1900 and it sounds like 19, it sounds like the who. It sounds like, no, it's, it's not really... 2016 but it's uh, it's 2000 what is what are they? by the second episode I go this music is so good this is so good for the picture it doesn't make sense on paper it's wrong on paper it's it's like crossing the line sometimes yeah. you know it's like this is wrong no it's not it's art it never stands still it doesn't follow rules it's art. It's subjective. And it's subjective, and it never stays the same. It's what happened yesterday is irrelevant. We're going this way, and right. and that's so. In the music thing, all those guys that come in with all the ego, going, "Oh, I know how it exactly how it ought to be." You know what? It's art. Yeah. There's no there's no cookie cutter bullshit with this. It's art. It's supposed to just breathe and live and change, and you know, and that's that's the good part of it. Well, the thing about art I've always said is that if it makes you react and it could make you react ne negatively, it could make you re react positively, then it did its job. If it makes you think and it makes you feel, then then that's what it was supposed to do. That's the game. That's yeah. the whole game. Yeah. But I think I think it's amazing that you that that that's your perspective because a lot of people would would get stuck in the ego. Would say well, you know, you can't do that. But it's it's really amazing, too, the older I get. And I don't know if you feel this way, just seeing how the the younger generation changes everything, you know. And sometimes they don't do it correctly or they do some things where you're like, oh. But other things are just, like when I watch YouTube, the stuff that my kids watch, it's it's amazing to me how much talent there is out there and how, how many people are creating art, you know. Hey, you know... Back in the old days, I can remember Pete saying and my mother and father saying, oh, no, it always comes back around. It repeats itself like like it was a circle. And, and, oh, it goes back to the beginning. I've come to the conclusion it never goes back to the beginning. It repeats, but it goes forward as it repeats. Right. So it's something changes about it. It keeps going forward. You know, it's like the it's like the. The, the folky guys now, well, they're not Pete Seeger and they're not Bob Dylan and they're not Joan Baez. They're not Peter, Paul, and Mary, your dad's favorite. They, they, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not, it, it doesn't repeat exactly. It repeats with forward motion so that it's always changing. That's art. That's that's the exciting part of it. That's the cool part of it. That's, that's the part that makes John Williams still a monster, a monster today. And, and, some 19-year-old kid just 
rolling out of SC or Berkeley or some or no place with an idea. That's what makes Cliff Martinez go, man, here's how we're doing this. And it be brand new and just go, oh, shit, this is so good. Yeah. I mean, do you, well, I know that like our friend Terrence O'Hara, you were telling me about his son and how talented his son was, who he now works for you. No. Or works with you. Thank you. Um, um, on, you know, job per job is what you were saying. But but how does that make you feel when you find somebody like that, where you, where you truly feel that they have a gift? You know, it's, it's timeless. It's ageless. It's colorless. It's, that's the cool thing about our gig. I mean, the music gig. You know what? You can quack it until you're blue in the face. You can posture, you can talk, you can have you can have tons of credits and tons of hardware in terms of awards and all the rest, and you can be rich as shit. You know what? How's it sound? Let me hear your stuff. Here, here's a guitar, let's play. Here's a piano, let's play. And all the all the quacking is finished. The playing starts and everybody knows. You know, you walk, I mean, I've seen fire and rain. I walk, I've walked in, you know, 24 years of age. And, Hello, Mr. Charles, so nice to meet you. Hey, Ray, how you doing? Let's go. You know, that makes a man out of you. You, you sit down with Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Ray Charles, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, Johnny Cash, guys like that, and you go, we're not screwing around here, guys. These are, this is the real deal, you know? I mean, like, okay, there's... All the talking stops and the playing starts. And and then it's, okay, let's see. Let's see. You know, when you stand in front of an orchestra in L.A., especially in L.A., and you got, you know, 60 of the greatest players on the face of the planet, and you got a baton in your hand, and you go, okay, here's my stuff. Here we go. Three, four, boom. No talking. Doesn't matter, you know, how... You know, nothing matters except the music. You know, it doesn't matter, black, white, none of, nothing matters. Just play me your stuff, buddy. You don't have to talk about it. Don't tell me how good you are. Play your thing. Because that's what shows you how good you are. Well, or... How bad you are. Yeah, yeah. But I like to end on how good you are. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for coming and, and being my guest. And I'm just... I'm in awe and I love you so much and thank you for being here and that's our show. Um, maybe I'll have you come back and we can continue because I feel like we have more to talk about. Any, anytime because I actually do love you. <laughs> so now the love fest is over and we're done. Good.